Hey, we appreciate you being here this morning. Looking forward to uh, having a wonderful time in our fellowship and also our worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, that song that you just heard, praise God for the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. That's the reason we're here, that uh, every man, woman, boy, and girl could know that Jesus Christ died for them and died for them specifically. If you're a guest with us this morning, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, if you haven't worshipped with us this, uh, before, we open our time together by raising our hands to our Lord. If you don't mind, please do that with me. Father God, we love you for who you are. We love you for the opportunity to be in your house. We love you that you and you alone are worthy of honor and power and praise. Lord, we lift our hands to you knowing that we have no power, but you have all power in heaven and in earth to grant your wishes. Lord, as we pray unto you today, we give our time to you. This time of where we magnify the great mission work going on throughout our world of those who need to know the gospel. The gospel was printed specifically for them, but yet they don't even know Jesus existed yet. We pray that we have a hand in assisting. Lord, we pray for Femi this morning, who will be speaking to us and sharing with us how he got to our area all the way from Nigeria. It still amazes me that we think of sending missionaries throughout the world, but the missionaries are coming back to us because we have not been faithful in spreading the gospel here on our own home turf. So we pray that uh, you would bless this morning. We also pray that if there's anything bothering us or troubling us, that we would be able to let it down right now. And we would focus upon you, finding ourselves in a spirit of worship. We give our time unto you. We ask that you would work mightily, that lives can be touched, that maybe today is a day of salvation for someone sitting in our midst, or that others may be touched to, to get busy supporting missions or going to the mission field. But most of all, we pray that your will would be done right here in this place. We give it unto you. We ask that you would work mightily. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, before we uh, introduce our guest speaker, I, I just want to say there's, a, there's kind of been a changing of the guard. Um, when I was younger, we talked about missionaries, and we thought that, that we had it all figured out here in the United States, and we needed to send missionaries to other places. Well, for some reason, we've kind of lost our focus a little bit. Not that God is not working still very strongly here, uh, but uh, as the population increases, we're finding that not only are we sending missionaries out, other countries are sending missionaries back to us. Why is that? Well, maybe we've uh, not doing quite as good a job as we should, but uh, I believe this is God's intention so that others that may be a little different than us, uh, maybe they don't dress like us, they don't live like us, but they too can know the gospel uh, right here locally. Uh, Pastor Femi Oki is with us today, and he is originally from Nigeria. He might share some of that with you. He's been here in the state since 2016. He came over here to, uh, to study and uh, get his theological background and all those things, and uh, he's attempting to plant a church in Charlotte. Um, Currently, they are meeting on the campus of Johnson C. Smith University, and uh, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle to find those that will be committed. But he is committed, and we want to be committed to him. I want to share some, uh, some very humbling statistics to you, and listen to these now. Would you believe that there are 371 million people in North America only 90 million of those profess to know Christ as Savior. That means there are 281 million who don't know Christ. That's a lot of work to be done. If we can support in some way, if we can reach out to others with the gospel, if we can shine a light right here from our own local church that others can know Him, then that's what we need to be doing. And we want to be devoted to helping missionaries like Pastor Oki. Femi, come on.
and share it with us. Would you give him a round of applause for being here? He's got a strong accent. I've asked him to go slow with us so we can get it. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, New Hope. I, I go here. I went to, I came to Anson County for the first time like two weeks ago because I needed to renew my license. I, I read on the internet that said that uh, Porkton DMV, those two ladies there are fantastic. And I said, well, that's where I'm going to go. And I drove one hour, 10 minutes to get there, to get my license. And I got there and um, I stayed outside for maybe one hour. And then when I got in, in five minutes, I was out of that place. And I felt like this is better, actually. The drive was worth it. So yeah, it is something, something good about this place. I love the DMV and I will come back <laughs> and, I will, and I will come back again next day. Um, I'm so, so, so thankful. Um, since I got here, I've uh, felt loved by you guys. Uh, and I think that new home is the church. And I think I might say this is my new home also. I love, when I came to the U.S., I love Tennessee. In case you are wondering, my accent is from Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay, uh, that, that was a joke. Um, I, I was born and raised in Nigeria, uh, but Knoxville, Tennessee was the first place I landed when I came to the U.S. And that was the first thing somebody told me. One sweet old lady said, you know what? Here, we speak slowly, okay? You speak slowly here. I said, okay. So I'm still, I'm still learning to speak slowly since I got to uh, the South. But in Knoxville, Tennessee, I was loved so much that even when I moved to Charlotte for seminary, I would go back to Knoxville every three months because I just love the place. Uh, people ask me, why Knoxville? I have no idea. But that was where God sent me when I came to the U.S. I loved Knoxville. I was loved so much there. But now I don't go back again now. I, I love Charlotte now. Maybe someday I'll be coming to a new home and just saying, I love these people there. I want to come there. Um, but um, today I'll be sharing God's word. And then if, while I was, I'm doing that, I'll be sharing my story in the midst of all that too. Uh, but um, the purpose of this time is to, is to share God's words uh, with, with, you guys, with you guys this morning. So would you open... Revelation 1 with me, and then can we stand to read God's words together, brothers and sisters? So this is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of the prophecies to the church and the blesses all who listen to its message and obey what, is, what it says, for the time is near. This letter is from John to seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who, who always was, and who is still, who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things. The first, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us, who has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I'm the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in patience and endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Our good God, we thank you for your word that is true, that is living, that is able to pierce our hearts, 
that is able to encourage us, that is able to call us to repentance, that is able to heal, that is able to comfort us, that is able to encourage us. Lord, this morning we ask that that word that is powerful and is living would do all those things and even more in our lives this morning. Lord, we ask that, um, would you use me? And it would you, your Holy Spirit, would he help all of us this morning be encouraged, be, strength, be strengthened, be affirmed, and be sent out on a mission to live for you, patiently enduring whatever light shows at us, and patiently enduring these battles of life, so that at the end, we might say, we have fought before the good fight of faith. And you can say to us, welcome, good and faithful servant. But we thank you this morning, and we ask that you would um, keep our time and bless our time. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let's see. I opened by saying, I, I called us brothers and sisters. And I know some of you are like, this, this boy, why, why, why can't he say fathers and mothers, grandfathers and grandmothers? It's not my word, it's, it's just the Bible. That's how, that is how Apostle John referred to people here. He said, brothers. And then if you read NIV, you, know, you read brothers and sisters. And, and if you read carefully, it says, I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that I in Jesus was on the island of Patmos, on the account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. At the beginning of this year, I, I, I said, I, want, I need to learn some spiritual discipline this year. And my coach, so I have a coach in church plant, where I'm church planting, I have a coach that meet with me every month or twice a month and is asking me, how are you doing? Don't tell me about church. Tell me about how are you doing? How is your soul? And then he said, so what are you trying to grow in this year? And I said, I want to grow in my devotion because I, I find myself reading a whole lot of the Bible because I want to teach. And I don't read the Bible because I want to grow for myself. So I spent a lot of time reading and I said, so you need to read for yourself. And I said, yes. And I said, uh, what book will you read? And I said, maybe Revelation. And so Revelation is one of those books where you don't really, you're not really looking forward to reading Revelation because there's a whole lot going on there that you don't understand. And I said, I want to, because I rarely read Revelation, I want to read Revelation. And because when you read Revelation, the idea is always that it's the story of end time, or you want to call it eschatology, or it's the story of heaven and hell. And I don't understand all these images, the beast, and then all these things. It feels like we don't, we don't get it. Like, why should we read all this book? Let me just read Mark. It's easier. And then... But don't worry about it. I'm not talking about all those things today, this morning. Pastor Scott would do a good job with that. I'm not. And it's a story. So while I was preparing, I read a story of these uh, seminary students. You know, one thing about seminary students is that they, are very, they, they, they pride themselves about how much they know the Bible. So one day, they were playing basketball. So while they were playing, there's this janitor that was sitting down somewhere and just reading the Bible. And then they, they moved close to him and they asked him, what are you reading? He said, I'm reading the Bible. And then they asked him, which book are you reading? He said, Revelation. Oh, so, the, you know, in seminary, you study all those, everything, free meal, our meal, or whatever word you want to do this week, we study everything. And then they said, oh, you can't understand what you're reading. And they asked him, so do you understand what you're reading? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, what are you reading? What does it mean? And he said, Jesus is going to win. And that's it. And I think that that is right. That is all what the book is about. Jesus is going to win. Jesus is going to win. So if anybody asks you about the book of Revelation, just say, Jesus is going to win. That's it. You're fine. So Revelation, the book itself, it's almost like a, the genre of the book. If you love to read different genre of books, the genre is one apocalyptic. If you, read, if you read Revelation 1 verse 1, it tells you this is the revelation. So it is apocalyptic in that sense. And also it's prophecy. 1 verse 3 clearly says there, um, verse 3 says, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy. So the book is also a prophecy. 
And then it's also a letter. And I think I would, I would camp there, the, the verse four, it talks about, verse four says that this letter, so Revelation is also a letter. So those are the three, the three ways you understand you read Revelation. It's, a, it's, it's apocalyptic, it's prophecy, but also it's a letter. It means letter to real people, to real church. So we, we see that. So now I'm saying, I'm talking about the letter now. And then so if you read the letter, this letter is that you can see it has all the elements of a formal letter. It has who is, who is writing the letter, who is being written to. Right there, if you read it, you, say, you can see um, that this letter is to a certain church in Asia by, by God. So this church, but by God to Jesus, to, to the angel and to John and to the church. So it's a letter. And while I'm trying to be a good preacher, I usually try to do alliteration and use like, okay, every word I'm going to talk about, my three points are going to be P, 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 P. But I struggle with the first one because um, the first letter I was trying to use, the first P, it couldn't really fit well. So I, I went with family. So the family is my first point I want to talk about. So as we read verse one, uh, chapter one, verse nine, like I said that this, this is a letter, in the opening, John says, hi, John. And I think that I just want to stop there a little bit. Hi, right, John. And John is, for John to say, hi, right, John, John is probably known to the church. They know him. This is not just any other John. It's not Papa John. It's John, the apostle. They know him. And he said, hi, right, John. It's like Pastor Scott travels to maybe Hawaii. I don't know where he likes to go for vacation. If he, go, he goes to Hawaii for sabbatical, and he's writing new home. He's going to say, hi, Scott, writing from Hawaii. And then you can see him here, hi, John. That was the opening. He's known by the church. The church knows him. And then it goes further. Or if maybe after I leave here, I'm writing you from Charlotte. I would say, Femi from Charlotte. Hi, Femi from Charlotte, in that sense. Or a missionary from this church goes to China, we'll probably say, Betty from, from Gonzo in China, in that sense. And then you can see that when John went further in this book, he also said, I, John, your brother, your brother. So the brother is, is, is a familiar language. It's a language of family, brothers, sisters. That's why I said when I opened the, 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 this morning, I said, brothers and sisters, will you read with me? It's a language of your family. In the sense, and then in the, in the, in the Old Testament, in, in that time, in that time, the, bro, the word brother is, is the language of endearment for these people. When they call you brothers and sisters, it's because we have the same family. We, lo we love each other. And then it allies the equality in Christ. If I call you brothers and sisters, it means that we are the same parents. We have the same family. We're equal. We share the same parents. So we are the same. And then he went further. So also is that when I call you brothers and sisters, is that we are doing away with the barriers that separate us. We're doing with the barrier of the haves and the have nots. Um, city versus um, maybe country. We're doing away with those barriers when I say brothers and sisters. That's what the gospel does. And that's what John is doing here. Is saying that my sense of family obligation predominates. It's not where I live. It's not who I am. It's now who we all belong to, Christ. And then you can, you can hear Jesus' words clearly here in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus was with people when he was teaching. And then... They said, your brothers and your, your mothers and brothers are waiting for you out there. They're, they're, they're waiting for you. What did he say? If you read Mark, Mark 3 verse 31, it, say, it, it says that, and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him. And they said, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? He said, and looking about 
at those who sailed around him, he said, Here are my brothers and my mother. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. That's Jesus' words. I didn't make that up. Again, brothers, sisters. Jesus is saying that those that do the will of the Father are his brothers and sisters. And the question I want to ask us is now, are we doing the will of God? Are you doing the will of God? My second point, partner in tribulation and the kingdom. I'm not really that creative, you can see. I'm just drawing it exactly from the text. So partner in tribulation and the kingdom. Same verse 9, we're still in verse 9. So when, Paul say, uh, when, when John said, I, John, your brother, and then he went further and he said, I am your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom. You see, it, remind, it reminds them that they are all, we are, we are, I'm John, I'm known by you, too, I am your family, but also, we also partner in ministry. And then in tribulation and in God's kingdom, all of that together. So John is saying that um, he is not saying that because I face troubles in my ministry right now, then we are brothers. No, that's not what he's saying. Oh, now I face trouble, then we are brothers. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that I am, rather, he's saying that your brother is facing trouble and is persevering. I'll tell you a little bit more about what is happening over there and in the island of Patmos where he is. But he's saying that your brother, John, your brother is facing a hard time, but he's still persevering. He's still holding on to Jesus, even when life is hard. And then John went further. And the things we can learn from John is that circumstances cannot inhibit the kingdom of God. Circumstances cannot stop the kingdom of God. God, Christ will build his church. Nothing can stop it. While John was on that island, he's still writing to brothers and sisters in church and saying that you should persevere. I am still your brother. Even though I'm in this place, I am still your brother. I am. We are still partnering in the gospel. And also, you see that John mentions, he said, he said, John mentions suffering of believers first. You know, he said, partner in tribulation, and then said, in the kingdom. He didn't say partner in kingdom first, and then later tribulation. You know, we love kingdom. We love the kingdom mindset. We, we sometimes tell ourselves, Jesus, let your kingdom come. We love that. But we don't love the tribulation part of it. But John is saying, a partner in tribulation and then the kingdom. So he says, what John is saying in essence is that the way to the kingdom is the way through tribulation. That's what he's saying. We can't get the kingdom without tribulation. And that's why I've termed my, my message like, uh, uh, like patient endurance. It's like, how do we endure before we get to that kingdom? So John is saying, I am a partner in tribulation and then the kingdom. And then that, does that remind us of somebody also in the Bible? Jesus. The path to the crown for Jesus was the cross. The cross came before the crown. Before he got a name that's greater than every other name, he had to go to the cross first. So the path to the kingdom is the path to tribulation. John shows us that a faithful Christian will not shrink from proclaiming the truth of God's word and the gospel message of Jesus, but will accept persecution to do it. We would willingly embrace hardship because we want to see the gospel being preached. We would embrace it. We would, we would love to do it because it's hard. Not because, not in spite of how, it's like in spite of how hard it is, we want to do it because we want to see the gospel reach the hands of the hurt. 
That is our call as Christians. And then, a reminder, we read James 5, 7 to 9. James was saying, Brothers and sisters, be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit. I love it. I'm in a country that everybody, everybody understands what it means to grow something. It says, it says, see as a farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it received the early and late rains. I don't even know what that means, but yeah, until it received the early and late rains. You also be patient. Be patient. And he said, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at end. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters. And the last one, last point, the patience endurance, still in that verse. It says that, and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. You see, the, the word, if you read the book of Revelation, you will see that word, patient endurance, over and over again, repeating itself. Again, I want to remind, remind us that John was writing this letter in a very harsh conditions. It wasn't as if he was in Charlotte, in a penthouse in Charlotte and just riding. No, it was in a hard conditions. You know, you hear the word island. Whenever you hear island, it feels like, oh, wow, it's a pretty cool place. No, it wasn't a cool place for him to go. It wasn't on vacation. It was in prison. And then it penned the word that we are reading today from the place of hardship. And it was still encouraging us to hold fast because Jesus is going to win. That's what he was saying. So I go further. It's like John, somebody said that John was not only writing a hard time, but he's like one of the things that John was missing was the church. Pastor John was missing, missing his people, his brothers and sisters in the Lord. He was missing them. See, when I, when, I left, uh, when I left Nigeria, 2016, I, one of the things I lost was I lost something familiar. Somebody was asking me yesterday, he said, what do you miss? He asked, what is different about here in Nigeria? And then the, I, said, I asked, I said, you should ask the question, what is not different between here and Nigeria? That should be the right question. Everything is different. That's what I told him. I said, everything is different. What do you mean what's not different? Um, so it is that when I left, I left something familiar. I left, I left friends. I left familiar food. When I got here, I started eating hamburgers. I, I didn't know that. I don't eat that back home. Pizza, no. But I left something familiar. And I was coming here. Ultimately, I left a home, comfort, family, brothers, sisters. I left all those things. And then when I got here, again, I was in Knoxville. I got to Knoxville, and then I was in school. So the college I got to, when I got to Knoxville, I got there early in the morning, 6 a.m., because I rode the Greyhound bus all the way from Chicago to Knoxville overnight. And I got there very early in the morning. So I got to the school, and the police officer was like, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean am I doing here? I have my, my bags here. I came to school. So, and then he said, well, school is not open. This is 6.30 a.m. You have to wait. I was like, okay, that's fine. I, I'm not going anywhere. I have all my bag here. So I had like two bags and I sat down there. And then until the lady that was the admission officer that I've been talking to through email showed up around 9 a.m. And then he said, so Femi, what are we gonna do? I said, I don't know, I came to school. And then she said, okay, let me send out emails to people and see who is gonna come around and show you your way around here. I was like, yeah, I'm not in a hurry. I'm here already. So she sent out this email and then 
Then, then nobody showed up until 12, on it, until like 12, nobody showed up at 12. And I was there. And then suddenly this lady showed up. So this is my, my couch story. I call it my couch story. This lady showed up. And then when she showed up, she was like, well, I was told to come show you around the campus. I was like, yes, show me around the campus. And then she showed me around the campus. And then we went around almost like an hour. And at the end, she said, so where are you going to sleep tonight? I said, I don't know. And then she was like, you don't know? I was like, yeah, I don't know. And then she said, will you sleep on my couch? I said, heck yeah. I will sleep on your couch. So that was what happened that night. I had nobody to sleep. I went to sleep and then I slept on the couch that night. Well, it was great. So I will tell you more about that later as I go on. But so what I was trying to say is that Pastor John missed home, lost something, lost the family of believers. And that's one of the greatest, greatest thing he lost while being on that, on that, on that highland. And he's writing to them and then asking them to persevere, asking them to endure, asking them that don't worry, Jesus is going to win, but hold on, keep enduring. And I think that some of us, to ask us now, some of us, does your heart hurt? Does your heart hurt when you're not in church? Does your heart hurt when you're not with believers, brothers and sisters? When you're away in Hawaii, does your heart hurt that I'm away from brothers and sisters in the Lord? Or you're like, I can't wait to get away. Is that you? Or you're like, I can't wait to get back to my brothers and sisters in the Lord. John, John was aching, his heart hurt that he was away with brothers and sisters and he was writing to encourage them. But sometimes we can't wait to get away. This summer, church is empty. I promise he didn't tell me, he didn't, he didn't ask me to say this, but I'm just saying this. He didn't ask me to say that, but I know I've seen churches. Summer, everybody's gone. We can't wait to get away. And again, are you hurting for those outside this, fa- outside this family? Or are you glad that they are not here? Are you hurting for those that doesn't know Jesus in our community? Are we going on mission to go find them? Or we're like, well, we're glad to have what we have here. We just keep it to ourselves. That's why we're doing what we're doing this weekend. Remind us, this family can be bigger. We hurt because there are others, or we should hurt because there are others that can be part of God's family that are not here yet. Jesus said in my father's house, there are many mansions. He has gone to pay a place for all of us. There's room, plenty of room. Or have we like that older brother in Luke 15, that when the father said, you know what? Your brother has returned. I was like, I don't care about him. Let him just stay where he is. And then stand aloof and say, I'm not entering the party. I'm not going to the party. I'm going to stand outside. And the father was like, your brother was dead. Now he's alive. Come inside. Like, no, I'm not. Let's be, let's be a different older brother that goes to go find our brother in a far country that are lost. Not even when they come in, we're like grumbling. It's like, why are they here? Is that us? Or are we the other one that go find them? So this is one of the reasons why we do the ministry we do in Charlotte. When I came to the U.S., I began to see my brothers and sisters that used to be Christians back home in Nigeria begin to walk away from the faith. My heart began to hurt. I began to look around my community that 
on a Sunday in church, I was an elder in the church, and I don't see people like me in the church coming to church. Like, what is happening? Where are they on Sunday? My heart began to hurt. And I said, let me go get them. Let me go find them. If they're not coming in, let me go find them. So that was the beginning of the, of, of, of the burden that God gave me when we begin to think about and, play, and praying about Manor House. It's our church's name in Charlotte. That how do we go find them? There are many, there are still rooms. Let's go get them. Bring them in. And then when we began to do that, 2021, we began Bible study. We began doing things, different things, and all of that. And let me tell you, that couch story I began earlier, the story of the couch, right? So that lady that gave me the couch that night, 2016, today is 2024. On Thursday night, I hold a Bible study every Thursday night. That lady is part of that Bible study. She joins that Bible study every Thursday night. 2016, she gave me the couch. 2024, I am teaching her about the gospel. You never know what your couch will do. You never know. You never know what a cup of coffee would do to someone. You never know. That couch rescued me that night. And then now she had she, she went she went through a season where I had to walk through walk with her. And I was like, God, this is really, really it's humbling to see they turn around. So you never know. I'm trying to close us now. So if tribulation is our road and the kingdom is our destination, then patience, endurance. It's our mode of travel. Christians will persevere on this journey. It's going to cost us something, but we persevere. To gather the kingdom is a road of tribulation. I know. I can see gray hair in the room. You've been doing that. I'm encouraged by that. I see I have a long way to go. There's so many black hair over here. But I'm encouraged to look around to see that. You've been following the Lord for 20, 40, 30, and how many years? I'm encouraged by that. I take comfort in that to see that. It challenges me that, well, I have a long way to go. I need to also patiently endure whatever I'm going through now. So that someday in 40 years, I can sit down like that with gray hair and say, I've been following the Lord for like 40 years now. So, when I was preparing, I was trying to figure out how to pronounce this, this Greek word, and I struggled a little bit. The, the Greek word John was using here to describe the patient endurance is, is a word that, all, that does, like, describes some passivity and also activity at the same time. It's like, oh, you, you, you're active at the same time you're passive. There is a part of the word patient endurance that is passive. It's like, you just, you just still, still, be still and know that I am God. But it's also the part of it that you have to do something. So it involves continual perseverance in faith and loyalty to Jesus, regardless of the difficulties and cost. John on Patmos showed us how, despite his improvement, uh, imprisonment, rather, Poverty and affliction, it continued to worship and serve Jesus. Please endure. Keep enduring. I'm teaching through the book of Hebrews now in my Bible study. And that's one of the, the, the big theme in the book of Hebrews also. He said, just hold on. Don't drift away. Just stay. Persevere. Don't become apostate. No, just stay. Keep holding on. So we have to do the same too. As those who are with John here as brothers and sisters in tribulation and the kingdom and patient endurance that are in Jesus. Jesus promised that the one who endures to the end will be saved. And Paul also adds in 2 Timothy 1, 2 verse 12, it says that if we endure, we will also reign with him. 
those that are on the field need your prayers, they need your support to also endure. They also need you to keep enduring. Keep enduring. I want to close now. I want to ask us, Jesus is going to win anyways. Jesus is going to win. And the question is that, but are you ready for his coming? Are we ready for his coming? Are we on mission for him? Let's keep enduring patiently in prayer, in evangelism, in giving. Some of us are giving our life. Yeah, keep doing it. Keep enduring what you're doing that. I know that Jesus will win. I mean, Jesus win. We also win. Let us pray. Father, we... Let me just stop. You could, you could just take a, take, a, take a minute. Just take a moment. In all I've, sh I've shared. And just ask Holy Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit asking of you this time? How is he asking you to endure? How is he asking you to persevere? How is he asking you to be patient? Whatever that looks like, just, just speak those words back, at, back to him. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, and even for myself, that you keep us, you sustain us, you would help us to endure. Not just endurance, but patiently enduring. This call you've given us, this life you've given us, help us to live it in a way that honors you, but also help us to live it Reckless abandon for all those around us that you've called us. That our heart, our heart hurts for those that are out there. Let us go find the, the least, the lost amongst us. Lord, we thank you for this word. And for in Jesus' mighty name we are pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please, and we'll get Tim to come on up. And uh, we're going to have a moment of invitation. And uh, invitation is pretty simple. If God has touched your heart this morning, if you feel there's something that you need to, to pray about, uh, maybe it's mission work, maybe it's someone that you know that is lost, uh, maybe it's uh, some problems in your relationships with family or other uh, folks, we just uh, we want to open up the altar and ask you to come and pray in just a moment as we sing. And also, if you'd like to join our church, or uh, maybe you want to rededicate your life, I would I would love to talk to you about that. But you let God be the decision maker. It's not about us. It's about Him. Uh, we do have a great meal awaiting us next door, but it'll wait a few more moments. We don't want to leave here without giving the opportunity for uh, Him to bless us by coming down and praying out to God. So let's pray. Father, we love you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in the lives of Pastor Oki and others that are serving on the mission field. We thank you for his obedience to come and share with us this morning, Lord. And we pray that we too can be faithfully obedient to you, holding steadfast your name and enduring until the very end, even when times are hard, dear God, that we could be more devoted to you in our uh, persistence of coming to church, of reading your word, and of reaching out to you in prayer daily. Father, whatever your will is this morning, I pray that you will lead folks to the altar, that they will come and let down their concerns, that they make them known to you. If there's someone here who needs to know you as Savior for the very first time, maybe they're, they're a guest with us today and they, uh, they feel your calling, your tugging, your nudging, maybe they will walk the aisle this morning someone here that would like to join our congregation in fellowship 
that would be great too. You work as only you can during this invitation time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You come as God leads.